queens of the world. Boudicca, Iceni queen of Celtic Britain. After the queen, her daughters, and her people were brutalized by the invading Roman army, Queen Boudicca rose up to lead the Iceni and the neighboring Celtic tribes in rebellion. They burned three cities to the ground, including the Roman capital, Londinium, before being defeated by the Roman army. Boudicca was born on the island of Britannia in the early 1st century. Exactly when and where is unknown. At this time, her people lived in small subsistence farming communities. Their homes were constructed out of wattle and daub, woven sticks covered in soil, clay, and dung. But they also had a few impressive technological achievements under their belts. They were excellent metal workers and crafted intricately designed jewelry, weapons, and invented chainmail to protect themselves in battle. The island was divided among at least 23 separate tribes, who frequently went to war with each other over territory and to capture slaves and human sacrifices. There was no sense of unity or British identity. While historians classify all the inhabitants of the island as Celts because of their common language and culture, they would have seen themselves only as members of their own separate tribes. Their society was illiterate, so their history was recorded by their greatest common enemy, the Romans. In 43 CE, the Romans invaded the southern regions of the island of Britannia and got to work subjugating the various tribes. They viewed the Celts as absolute barbarians with customs wildly different from their own. The Celts fought fiercely in battle, shouted insults, guttural animal noises, and blew into horns to intimidate their enemies. Warriors often fought shirtless and painted designs on their bodies, leaving the Romans to dub them Picts or the Painted People. The Celts liked to behead their enemies and keep their craniums as trophies, as they believed a person's spirit resided in their head and they let women fight in their armies, absolutely abhorrent to the orderly, hyper-masculine Romans. But the Romans' well-trained and disciplined legions, advanced military techniques, and elephants quickly overwhelmed the native Celts. Roman Emperor Claudius, who wasn't much of a military man, showed up after the battles had been won for a quick 16-day victory tour of his new possession, before returning to Rome and leaving his soldiers to occupy and oppress the island. The occupation was brutal. Celts who weren't killed in battle were enslaved and the women raped. Queen Boudicca first appears in historic record around 47 CE. She was the wife of King Prastagus of the Iceni tribe which inhabited modern-day Norfolk. Her name, Boudicca, was a common Celtic woman's name and means victorious. Roman historian Cassius Dio gives us the only existing description of the indomitable queen. He characterizes her thus, very tall, most terrifying in appearance. She had tawny hair hanging down below her waist, a harsh voice, and a piercing glare. She habitually wore a large golden necklace, a colorful tunic, and a thick cloak fastened by a brooch. Let's take a closer look at this description of our leading lady. Roman historians often describe the Celts and Gauls as very tall, broad, and brawny. And according to archaeological evidence, they were on average taller than their Roman contemporaries. And a Roman might describe his enemy as most terrifying in appearance, for how strange and barbaric she looked compared to the women he knew back home. After all, it's only natural to exaggerate the monstrosity of an enemy, especially one who wallops you in battle. Boudicca is generally depicted with red hair, but that may not have been the case. The traditional translation of the word used to describe the queen's tresses is tawny, a reddish-brown hue, but the actual Latin word was xanthos, which has also been used to describe gold, sand, corn, and lions. So, she was more likely blonde. 
but the distinct Britishness of Ginger Hare and Boudicca's later importance as a British hero mean she is most often depicted as a ginger. The fact that Boudicca wore her hair loose rather than pinned up as Mediterranean women did would have looked particularly wild and animalistic to Roman eyes. Her harsh voice and piercing glare surely add to the terrifying nature of her appearance, but could also be viewed as the inquisitive gaze and decisive orders of a cunning and commanding queen. Again, a great contrast from Roman women who were expected to behave demurely. The rest of the description captures the customary dress of a Celtic woman of the time. The large golden necklace she habitually wore would have been a torque, which denotes a woman of high status. These solid metal neck rings had a small opening in the front and would have been put on once but difficult to remove after that. Tartan or plaid was woven and worn in the British Isles beginning in the 8th century BCE. This design is made when colorfully dyed strands of wool are woven into a pattern of right angles. So it is very likely that Boudicca's colorful tunic would have been made of tartan. Her thick cloak, also woven from wool, would have been fastened by an intricately decorated gold brooch, another symbol of status. Celtic brooches of the time consisted of a ring and a pin, which used together would hold the cloak in place. After seeing the carnage that befell other tribes who resisted Roman rule, King Prastagus decided to ally himself with the invaders, thus sparing his people from bloodshed and maintaining a modicum of independence. He even aided the Romans in defeating the neighboring tribes who were not so willing to surrender. The Roman governor offered the Iceni a loan of 40 million sesterns. The Celts didn't need the money, they were rich in gold and other resources, but they accepted it anyway, as it was the only way they could trade with the Romans and integrate into the new society growing around them. Prasticus made a will, leaving half his kingdom to his two daughters, and appointing his wife, Boudicca, as their regent, and the other half he left to the new Roman emperor, Nero. This act of deference, he believed, would secure a peaceful alliance. In 60 CE, King Prastagus died, safe in the knowledge that his family and kingdom would enjoy a lasting harmony with the Romans. But of course, that's not how things turned out. Back in Rome, the new emperor, Nero, was an eccentric man and an extravagant spender. He paid for his lavish parties, construction of amphitheaters, and other public works in his own honor by raising taxes across the empire. His newly appointed governor of Britain, Suetonius Polinos, thus called back the 40 million sesterns which he had lent to the Iceni. He demanded that it be paid back in full, plus interest, immediately. When this unreasonable demand could not be met, the governor used it as an excuse to attack the Iceni and take their territory by force. He didn't recognize the rule of their queen, Boudicca, as legitimate because she was a woman. Roman soldiers forced their way into every Iceni home, confiscated anything of value, raped the women, and bound the people into slavery. Even the royal family was not spared. Boudicca's two daughters were raped, and when the queen tried to protect her children, she was stripped naked and whipped bloody in front of her people. By turning Boudicca from friend to enemy, the Romans would soon learn that they had made a grave error. Brutalized and traumatized, Boudicca became determined to reap her revenge upon the Romans. She called a meeting with her traditional enemies, the Trinovantes, the neighboring tribe which occupied modern-day Essex. The tribal leaders met and learned that they had all been treated in the same brutal way by the Romans. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so these ancient rivals decided to band together against their common foe, and they were all hungry for vengeance. As the Roman governor never would have expected a recently decimated Celtic tribe, 
especially one led by a woman, to give him any trouble. He had marched his army far west to defeat an uprising in Wales. They left the Roman city Camulodunum, modern-day Colchester, completely undefended. Boudicca saw this as the ideal opportunity to strike. With sword in hand, adorned in battle paint, and riding her chariot, Boudicca led a force of 120,000 warriors to attack the city. She called on Andraste, the Celtic goddess of victory, to aid them in battle. Camulodunum had been the capital of the Trinovantes tribe, but the Romans had cast them out and taken it over to house retired soldiers. These were the veterans who had conquered Britain a generation earlier, and they were deeply hated by the Celts for their decades of brutality. But in their dotage, they weren't up for staging much resistance. In the city center, they had erected a temple in honor of the now deified Emperor Claudius, further insulting the Celts. Boudicca's army quickly overwhelmed the city, killing every Roman they could find. Those who managed to survive held up in the temple of Claudius. They sent for help to the Roman capital city of Londinium. Three guesses what that's called today. But leaders there underestimated the female-led Celtic forces and sent only 200 unarmed enslaved soldiers to their aid. They defended the temple of Claudius for two days, but eventually the Celts set the temple on fire, killing everyone inside. In front of the temple stood a bronze statue to Emperor Nero, which the Celts decapitated, keeping the head as a trophy of war. Londinium next sent a slightly stronger force of 2,500 armed soldiers, but these two were wiped out. With no one standing in their way, Boudicca's army turned their sights southwest to the Roman capital. As they marched, more and more Celtic warriors joined the army, eager to seek revenge on their ruthless Roman overlords. When word of the rebellion reached Governor Suetonius, he made haste to march his army back east. He considered defending Londinium, but as his force only numbered 5,000, he realized that he was no match for Boudicca. So he decided to sacrifice the city for the province. Wealthy citizens and traders fled Londinium and the city's poor were left undefended when Boudicca arrived. The Celts rampaged through the city. They set free enslaved Celts who joined up with the rebellion, and they tortured and killed every Roman they found. They had no interest in taking prisoners as slaves. Everyone they didn't slaughter in battle was put to death by fire or strung up on a gibbet or cross. An estimated 70 to 80,000 people are believed to have been killed by Boudicca's rebellion. The Celts burned Londinium to the ground. Next, they sacked the neighboring city of Virulanium, modern-day St. Albans. Cassius Dios wrote, All this ruin was brought upon the Romans by a woman, a fact which, in itself, caused them the greatest of shame. Meanwhile, Governor Suetonius recruited all the veteran soldiers who could still hold a sword, bringing his forces up to almost 10,000 troops. Still heavily outnumbered, he decided to make his stand on strategic ground. He waited for the Celts on the Roman road now known as Waddling Street, in a narrow gorge with forests protecting his flank. Boudicca's forces were now between 230 and 300,000 warriors. During their march across the country, they brought with them a train of carts which carried their baggage, civilians, women, and children. Cassios Dio records that before the battle, Queen Boudicca gave a fiery speech to her army. If you weigh well the strengths of our armies, you will see that in this battle we must conquer or die. This is a woman's resolve. As for the men, they may live or be slaves. I am not fighting for my kingdom and wealth now. 
I am fighting as an ordinary person for my lost freedom, my bruised body, and my outraged daughters. This oration, which seems perfect for a Hollywood movie, probably never happened, but it makes for an exciting story. And so the Battle of Waddling Street commenced. Because of the narrowness of the gorge, the Celts were prevented from slamming their full might into the significantly smaller Roman force. The 10,000 Roman soldiers were heavily equipped with full suits of armor, helmets, spears, shields, and sandals complete with nails, which prevented them from slipping. The Romans got into the classic battle formation, which had won them territory all across the world and built their mighty empire. They crouched together behind their shields like a turtle, safe from attack. Soldiers in the back of the formation threw spears across the battlefield at the Celts, which cut through their bare chests and chainmail. Once they got to close combat, the front row of Roman soldiers would fight for a few minutes and then rotate to the back for a rest. This way, the front line remained fresh and strong, while the Celts, exhausted, were mowed down. With thousands of Celts dead on the field. Suetonius gave the order for his men to get into a triangular formation and charge the enemy, forcing what was left of them to retreat. The baggage train full of women and children pinned the fleeing soldiers in. Romans nearly always captured their enemies' women and animals and sold them. But such was their fury at the rebellious forces that no living thing was spared the slaughter. The Romans recorded that 80,000 Celtic men, women, and children were killed during the battle, while only 400 Roman soldiers died. But you can't always trust history when it is recorded by the victors. What became of Queen Boudicca after the battle is unknown. Tacitus recorded that she escaped the slaughter. First, he wrote that she died shortly afterward from battle wounds, but later he changed his story to say that she had poisoned herself. In Roman culture, poisoning was a shameful woman's way to die. The only right way for a soldier to go was in the heat of battle. Cassius Dios, on the other hand, reports that the warrior queen escaped, later died of an illness, and was given a lavish funeral and honored by her people. There are no accounts of what became of Boudicca's two daughters. Despite coming out victorious in the end, Suetonius was replaced as governor by Emperor Nero, who was furious at having lost the city of Londinium. The story of the Iceni queen who rose up against the mighty Roman overlords and burned three cities to the ground was largely swept under the rug by the embarrassed empire. Boudicca was forgotten for a millennia and a half, save a few hand-me-down tales and scant mentions in historic tomes. 6th century monk Gildas tells of a treacherous lioness who butchered the governors of Roman rule. During the 16th century reign of Queen Elizabeth I of England, the legend of Queen Boudicca was rediscovered and repopularized. Gloriana herself was a fiery redhead who gave a famous speech to her troops before they defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. In 1610, Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher wrote a play entitled Bonduca, or The British Heroine. In 1695, Henry Percival turned the play into a musical, and one of its choruses, Britain's Strike Home, became a popular patriotic song in the 18th and 19th centuries. It is possible that Queen Boudicca was an inspiration for Britannia, the personification of Britain as a female warrior holding a trident and shield and wearing a Roman helmet. But the Iceni queen took on legendary proportions in the Victorian era. Parallels were drawn between Boudicca and the young Queen Victoria. They were both seen as leading the British people on to victory, the meaning of both of their names. 
little thought was given to the irony that Boudicca was resisting foreign oppressors, while the British were now the oppressors of foreign lands. Victoria's poet laureate, Alfred Lord Tennyson, wrote the epic poem Boudicca. Several ships were named after the Iceni Queen, and a statue of her was erected in London, the city she once burned down. Boudicca riding her chariot into battle is ironically positioned so that it appears as though she is attacking the Houses of Parliament. In the 19-teens, British suffragettes adopted Boudicca as one of the symbols of the campaign for women's right to vote. The location of Boudicca's defeat or burial have never been conclusively determined. An urban legend sprung up in World War II, while Londoners were sheltering in tube stations during the Blitz, that Queen Boudicca was buried between platforms 9 and 10 of King's Cross Station. Author J.K. Rowling said she was not aware of this myth when she chose platform 9 and 3 quarters of King's Cross Station as the magical access point to the Hogwarts Express, the train which takes young witches and wizards to school in the Harry Potter series. In 2001, an Iron Age archaeological site called the Wet Wang Graves was discovered in Yorkshire. One of the bodies found was that of a woman who was buried as a queen. She is wearing fine jewelry and interred with weapons and a full chariot. The woman was very tall in her late 30s or early 40s, and her face was disfigured by a battle wound, which might have caused a Roman historian to describe her as most terrifying in appearance. Whether or not this ancient queen was indeed Boudicca is not clear. Carbon dating places the remains about 200 years before she lived, but the accuracy of carbon dating has recently been called into question. Wherever the remains of Boudicca, warrior queen of the Iceni, rest, she remains a powerful symbol of strength, resistance to oppression, and the British people. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.